Hello and welcome to another edition of Flip Classroom with Mr. Woodcock. Um, we are now going on our fourth week of school, not in school. So it's kind of crazy if you think about it. It's hard to even remember exactly how many days that that's really been. Um, but, um, you know, we have to keep moving. We have to keep going. It's kind of a lot of you are probably planning on going to college or, or you know, at least a technical school or something. And then there's probably going to be times that um, you're going to be taking online classes. There's a lot of online classes offered to people these days. Uh, a lot of schools have kind of gone to all online um, in a lot of ways. So, um, you know, even if you don't go to school right out of, of high school, there's a, a strong possibility that you might, you know, one day be taking uh, college classes somewhere down the line online. So this is a good experience just to, to kind of get a feel for what that's like to a degree. Now, I'm not going to say that, that the, the class that, that I'm giving is college level. I mean, we're kind of doing all this on the fly, but, um, you know, it could be a, a good experience for you nonetheless. So, um, you know, we're, we're transitioning to a unit on uh, World War II. And I'm having to break up just getting into World War II into a couple of lectures. Um, this one on the interwar years in Europe and then another one that I'll be posting later on this week on the interwar years in uh, Asia um, because they're, they're pretty significant. Um, there are a lot, of, a lot of things that happen over there are very significant and have a lot of bearing, especially on us here in the United States. Um, and maybe even more so than the interwar years in Europe. Um, but there's a there's a lot to get there, and hopefully hopefully this is kind of something that you all are a little more interested in than you know some of the things that we went on you know we went through earlier this year like the Reformation and Renaissance and you know the French Revolution as interesting as I think the French Revolution is, um, but you know this one's something that we all know more about. Um, every every one of us has heard of Hitler. We're familiar to some degree with the World Wars. We know the United States was involved. Um, you know, we've seen movies about it. Um, you know, I've had several people ask me about Dunkirk, um, mainly just because Harry Styles is in it, but, um, you know, Dunkirk was a World War II movie. Um, and we're going to get almost to Dunkirk today, but we'll save, uh, actual Dunkirk for another time. Um, but, um, you know, Saving Private Ryan, another great World War II movie. Hopefully you've had a chance to watch that that one before. That's a great one. Uh, Band of Brothers on HBO is a great World War II series. The Pacific on World War uh, uh, the HBO series on World War II, a great uh, World War II series. A lot of a lot of great stuff has come out on World War Two. Way more than has come out on World War One, uh, mainly because World War One is just so dark and, and dreary. Um, and not to say that World War Two doesn't have its dark moments. I mean, certainly, uh, but World War Two you have a really more clear um, good versus evil dynamic, and then the good winning. Um, so you know that kind of gives people more of a positive spin. But uh, certainly, when we talk when we get into talking about the Holocaust. You know, there's a lot of dark there um, for us to process. But anyway, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started on the interwar years in Europe. Now, this is the time specifically uh, between the end of World War I and the beginning of World War II. So you've got between 1918 and 1939 officially is when things get started on September 1st, 1939, when uh, Germany invades Poland. Um so you've got, you know, I, I, I entitled it the interwar years uh, in Europe, the 20-year armistice. That's roughly about what it is. Um, not to say that there isn't violence that happens during that time. We're going to talk about some of the events. Um, you know, you've got the Spanish Civil War that breaks out uh, in 1936. You've got the uh, Italian invasion of Ethiopia, uh, which happens in 1935. Uh, so to act like the, there wasn't violence happening in Europe during this time isn't isn't correct, but you know the real war hasn't broken out yet. So, got some key vocabulary terms that you'll need to know. Uh, good idea to write these down. Maybe pause your 
uh, lecture wherever you're at right now and write these down. These are all going to be important. We're going to talk about all these words as we go through. Um, we may not get to spend as much time as I'd like to on some of these words, but um, these are all the important terms, uh, some of the people and terms. Um, some of these you've probably never heard before, like a plebiscite. You're probably like, what is a plebiscite? Basically, a plebiscite is just a vote. Um, at the end of World War One, there were areas of Europe who were divided up, but they weren't. Nobody was really sure exactly where those people belonged. Like, did they? Did this area belong to France? Did it belong to Germany? Did it belong to Poland, which is which was a new country that hadn't been on the map, um, you know, for a long time, but was was now on the map. There's this area called the Danzig Corridor that's going to um, cause a lot of problems. Um, there's this area called the Sudetenland um, that goes to Czechoslovakia, but it has a lot of ethnic Germans there. So what what happens with the Sudetenland? There's this place called the Saar Valley. Um, anyway, the way that the Treaty of Versailles was set up is after a certain amount of time, the League of Nations would administer that area, and then on a certain date, they would have a vote to decide you know, what was going to be done with that area. The people in that area got to decide for themselves, whether they wanted to, um, you know, remain independent, whether they wanted to join another country. Um, so that happened a lot. And one famous incident is the, is the Saar Valley, and we'll talk about that. Um, but there were there were several different places uh, they got to decide for themselves which way they should go. Um, you've got this guy here, Benito Mussolini, El Duce, um, as he was called, which is kind of funny today, you know, with the, the slang terms that we throw around, you got to be kind of careful calling uh, Benito Mussolini El Duce. Um, maybe you think he is a big El Duce, who knows? Um, anyway. <laughs> so those are the, those are the vocabulary terms. We'll talk about each of them as we go. Um, so we'll start off talking about post-war Italy because that takes the least amount of time to talk about. Um, but similar to Germany, after World War I, Italy is very unhappy with the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. They thought they were treated, um, you know, very badly by the Allies. They had they had agreed to fight alongside the Allied powers to help them win a victory, and they felt like they played a part in that. Uh, and they had some some very clear uh, goals that they wanted to have achieved with the peace. There was some there was some territory that they wanted, especially around the Adriatic coast, and they didn't get it. Um, and in fact, um, their claims to overseas um, territory for the most part was kind of put on the back burner, and they were really offended uh, by the amount of of the loot that they got after World War One. So you had the people like Benito Mussolini. Now Mussolini, before World War One, had been a hard left, um, you know, Marxist. That might not be the right word, but he, he was he was kind of a, a Marxist uh, journalist. Um, he was a he was a newspaper writer, uh, basically. Um, but but during the war, he kind of switched from being Marxist to being really nationalist. Um, and it's kind of a fine line. Is do, do you support workers or do you support you know your ethnic nationality? And for him, um, after the war, he was Italian and he believed in a greater Italy and, and basically the the um, refounding of the former Roman Empire. Um, so he becomes a, a nationalist. He gar garners some fame, um, you know, as a, as an outspoken critic of the government. Um, he's a very good writer. Remember, he was a journalist. Uh, and he's a good uh, speaker, good public speaker. Uh, and he riles people up. Um, and he, he forms what's called the Fascist Party. Um, and, you know, fascism, basically just the, the, the um, total control um, of the, of the state by, a, you know, a military dictator, essentially. Um, and, you know, that's kind of what he believed, that, that there needed to be this military dictator who took over Italy, kind of like a Julius Caesar, coming onto the scene to reestablish the Roman Empire. And in order to help him achieve his goals, he uh, surrounded himself with these people called the Black Shirts. Um, these are going to be very, very similar to... Uh, the stormtroopers in Germany, the brown shirts in Germany, um, who kind of are the muscle. They're paramilitary, which means they're not military, but they kind of act like a military uh, group. 
who basically go around, they break up strikes, they break up protests, um, and they deal very heavy handedly with anybody who disagrees with them to the point where you better have some muscle with you if you're going to disagree with them. Um, and it's a really good way to kind of crack down um, on people who don't like you. Um, and he comes to, he uh, is able to secure some electoral victories. Uh, and by 1923, he is. Uh, um, a constitutional leader of Italy, de facto leader of Italy in 1923. Now, Italy is complicated because he is technically, you know, the dictator of Italy, but there's a prince. Uh, there's actually a, or I'm sorry, a king of Italy who's there. His name is Victor Emmanuel. He is the king of Italy. And at any time, he could stop Mussolini if he wanted to. But for whatever reason... He doesn't want to, and he pretty much stays out of Mussolini's hair um, and is kind of off the scene all the way until the end of the war. It's a, it's a strange dynamic, but that's Italy for you at this time. Mussolini's in charge. There's a king. The king probably has the authority to do what he wants, but he doesn't. So that's why people don't talk about him, because it really it's Mussolini who's in charge. Um, but eventually he sets up a dictatorship in 1925. There's a famous incident where he has uh, a member of the Italian legislature murdered. Um, now, it's not very clear that he necessarily had him murdered. Everyone thinks that he had him murdered. There's not really a lot of, of clear evidence that he had him murdered. But that's the belief everybody had, and basically nobody does anything about it. And at that point, from that point on, it's Mussolini's show. Everybody knows you know, the consequences for crossing Mussolini is he'll have you shot and nothing will ever happen to him. He has no more consequences. So he takes so he takes firm control as the dictator in 1925, um, and he's going to rule Italy all the way until 1945 when he's going to be uh, brutally murdered by his own people. So that's post-war Italy in a nutshell, and we'll come back and talk more about them later. Um, as we get into the war, but they're going to, you know, it's kind of interesting. He's the first to come onto the scene. Hitler actually idolizes Mussolini and what Mussolini's done. And eventually he's going to supplant uh, Mussolini by a long shot. Uh, so the Treaty of Versailles and the Weimar Republic, I know it says Weimar, but in German, the W's are V's. Um, so the Treaty of Versailles forced Germany to become a constitutional monarchy. Um, or at least some form of representative government. Um, and so they tried to start a republic. Uh, and it's called the Weimar Republic, and it's going to be in existence for a while. But they're, um, it's very tumultuous. Um, it's, it's hard enough to form a democracy. Um, you know, it's harder when you're coming off of a losing war effort where millions of your uh, people have been killed. You've had, um, you have these huge reparation payments that you're forced to make that cripple your economy. Uh, your, your military is, is reduced. Um, you know, things are not great in Germany anyway, and now you have to form this new government that not everybody's in favor of, um, and you end up with these clashes on the streets between, um, you know, these uh, communists on one side and these um, basically fascists on the other side, already in 1919, there's already violence, almost like it looks like the country's going to break out into a civil war. Um, but a couple of, of assassinations of some uh, communist leaders, and that kind of dies down a little bit, and you have some peace for a little while in the Weimar Republic. But uh, by 1923, you have this runaway hyperinflation that nobody knows how to do anything with. Um, and basically, hyperinflation. Um, if you know what inflation is, inflation is just, you know, over time where currency is not worth what it used to be worth. You know, like for instance, today is probably not a great example, but used to gas used to be less than a dollar. Today, gas is generally between two and three dollars a gallon. Um, that's an example of, of, uh, inflation. Um, but <clears throat> inflation was so bad, um, in Germany that money was really worthless, um, you know, like you see in the, in this picture, you have these kids who are stacking, you know, probably hundreds of thousands of, of marks, which were German dollars at the time, because they weren't worth anything. 
Um, my college professor used to say that, you know, people would work um, up until lunchtime. At lunchtime, they would get paid cash, which was like wheelbarrows full of money, um, just completely full of money. And then they would have to spend their entire lunch hour trying to trade um, that money in that wheelbarrow for something for some firewood, for a loaf of bread, you know, something, because it really wasn't worth anything. It was almost worth uh, more to take the money and burn it um, than to actually, you know, trade it for something. Um, but it was, it was better for, um, for, for fire. Um, and it, it forced Germany into this severe depression. So on top of all the other problems that the Weimar Republic has, um, you know, generally speaking, whenever economic times are hard, people blame the government um, for the reason why things are that difficult. So it's it's tough for a republic to really get on its feet under these circumstances. So that leads to Adolf Hitler in some of the early days of Adolf Hitler. Um, you know, like in Italy, many Germans are furious over the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. There, most people, um, you know, don't really agree on whose fault all of this is. Um, now, Hitler belongs to a group of people who blame the communists and socialists for the reason why Germany lost the war. They believe that they were shirkers um, and they were they were strikers, and they hampered the war effort, and they basically stabbed the German soldier in the back. Um, and force the Germans to lose the war. And, you know, I said communists and, and socialists, but to Hitler and to a lot of Germans, all communists and socialists were basically Jewish. So they kind of associated Jews with communism and socialism. Um, and so there was this strong dislike for those people because they felt like they had stabbed Germany in the back and forced Germany to lose this war that they were just about to win. And Hitler just can't understand, he can't process it in his mind um, how Germany actually lost this war. And, and so he has to blame them because he doesn't know who else to blame. Um, although, you know, he could have blamed his own government. He could have blamed his own people. He could have blamed just the situation that they were in. But he couldn't, you know, to him, he couldn't reconcile that Germany could be defeated. Um, to him, Germany could never be defeated. Um, so, you know, and, and, and that'll be a popular phrase among former soldiers, um, for the next 20 years that Germany had never actually been defeated because Germany didn't actually fight a battle on German soil. They, you know, even at the end of world war one, they hadn't been pushed back into German territory yet. Um, they were still in France, so they just did not understand, um, how any of this could be possible. Uh, so Hitler joins this group, um, this small political party known as the German Workers' Party, uh, or the DAP, um, and the, the D stands for Deutschland, so if I say this reason it's not the GWP, um, and they, event they soon change their name to the Nationalist Socialist German Workers' Party. Um, now, they are not socialist um, at all. <laughs> they don't really have any socialist tendencies. Um, they're very nationalistic. Uh, but mainly they, they changed their name um, to the National Socialist Party to try to garner more attention um, and to kind of make people want to be, to want to join their party more. Um, because, you know, a lot of people were going socialist at the time. So, you know, hey, cool, let's put socialist in our name. That's going to bring more people into our coffee, uh, you know, brunches. And then we can kind of hit them with our propaganda and then they can decide for themselves. But we'll use socialists to kind of drag them in. Um, and then they can decide for themselves whether they really, you know, agree with this or not. Because, you know, one thing about socialism back then, um, you know, books were pretty widespread, but not everybody's reading books. And not everybody's reading Marx and all the other, you know, ideolo ideologues. Um, but everybody kind of likes the idea of socialism to some degree. So, um, you know, at the time. So putting, putting that in your name is a good way to draw people in. Um, but Hitler starts to reorganize um, the NSDAP, or the National, we'll just call them Nazis, um, to um, try to stage a coup um, to take over Germany using um, Erich von Ludendorff, who was the field marshal of the German army at the end of World War I. And they get Ludendorff to kind of play along. 
Um, and they are going to actually stage this coup to overthrow the Weimar Republic and install Ludendorff as basically a, a, kind of like a king of Germany. Um, so he gets these, these SA, or stormtroopers, um, together, about 3,000 of them. Um, and they go into Bavaria, and um, there's this, this famous beer hall putsch. Um, where basically they go in, they get some they they uh, get some agreements from local leaders uh, to kind of play along. They're trying to get to uh, the capital of Bavaria. Um, it starts to go poorly. Uh, Hitler contemplates suicide there in 1923, and eventually he is going to be arrested. Um, now he is going to get arrested and charged with high treason. Now. If you don't know what high treason is, high treason is be- or treason is basically a crime, uh, a betrayal of your country. You know, you think of Benedict Arnold, people like that. Generally speaking, the punishment for high treason for almost all nations up until even just recently has been execution. Um, there's not really any other, you know, usually you don't get any kind of other uh, treatment. You usually just get the uh, uh, you either get the noose or you get the the hatchet or something you know something's gonna happen to you that's bad and you're gonna die. Uh, but Hitler doesn't. Hitler actually gets sentenced to five years in prison, um, and he only serves one year of it. Um, so he was very fortunate. He had a very uh, kind judge. You know, if we could have gone back in time and convinced that judge to dish out the punishment they usually give for you know a attempted takeover of an entire country. Um, then, you know, all of what we're going to talk about today, maybe that none of it happens, but you know, and this is going to be a long, there's going to be a long line, a string of events that lead into world war two that, you know, Hitler could have been stopped here, but no one stopped him. And then he was able to continue on. So this, this is just the, the first example that we're going to see. So while he's in prison, uh, he writes this book called Mein Kampf. Uh, now, Mein Kampf in German means my struggle. Um, and he kind of puts down his thoughts about the Weimar Republic, about World War I, why the Germans won World War I, what the German, and kind of lays out his whole Aryan national or nationalistic tendencies that Aryans um, were the superior race in the world and that they needed to, they needed to get this thing called Lebensraum. Uh, and Lebensraum just means elbow room. Uh, in German, and basically just that they needed to expand their borders in order to make sure um, that, you know, in the event that they go to war, eventually they can be completely self-sufficient. They can they can feed themselves. They can uh, they already knew they could make the arms uh, manufacturing just fine. But what they didn't have was the wheat fields of the Ukraine and places like that. And he basically lays out that Germany needs to invade the Ukraine. Uh, they need to conquer all the way to the Ukraine, into Russia, and take over those areas because they were the superior race, and that was their territory, and they should just do it. Um, he also blames Jews and communists for stabbing Germany in the back. I think we already talked about that. Um, but he kind of lays it out in this book. Um, and, I mean, it's, it's crystal clear for everyone to see what exactly this guy believes, and not everybody takes him at his word. A lot of people are not going to take him literally. A lot of people don't think think that, that he's too smart to just do the things that he says. And again, you know, there's an opportunity that people could have looked at here and said, this guy's crazy, we need to stop him now, but it's not going to happen. Uh, and mine, you can still read Mein Kampf today. You can still see, um, you know, what this guy was all about even back then. So... Following Hitler's release from prison, uh, he began reforming the NSDAP and trying to consolidate his power even further. Um, after the stock market crash in 1929, the German economy tanks once again, just like the rest of the world. So, you know, he had a few years where things got better in Germany, but now everybody's sunk under um, and people are calling in their debts to the German government and they don't have the money. Um, and over time, the NSDAP uh, or the Nazis start to get more and more people into the um, national legislature. By 1933, they've got 43% of the votes. Um, and this is not a two-party system, so 43% is pretty much a majority. Um, at the time, 
um, but they don't have enough of a majority to, to form, you know, a government under one party. So they have to form a coalition government, which, you know, that Hitler's not really about that. Um, so they start taking greater control of the German Reichstag, which is the, the parliament. Um, Hitler runs for president of Germany in 1932, um, but he loses. Um, and the, but the president, Hindenburg, is approached by two very prominent politicians who believe that Hitler needs to be on in some form in the government because the, basically people are afraid of the Nazis at this point. Um, they're familiar with this paramilitary group. They're familiar with the ruthlessness. They kind of fear for their own lives. They believe that putting him into power might kind of solve that a little bit, at least for them. Um, and they um, basically convince Hindenburg to name and appoint uh, Adolf Hitler as the Chancellor of Germany in 1932. Again, another huge mistake. You know, back in if somebody could have gone back to Hindenburg and just said, "Don't do this. It's a bad idea." Um, Hindenburg's not going to be around to see much of it anyway. He's going to die in 1934, um, and we'll, we'll look at that in a second. But first, uh, Hitler consolidates more power after a fire was set in the Reichstag by this by a communist agitator. Um, there's no evidence that this was a coordinated attempt by German communists um, to try to stop Hitler. Um, there is a lot of evidence. Uh, it's believed that the guy who set the fire was a communist, but is probably acting on his own. Um, but because he sets this fire, um, the German, the German uh, government actually grants Adolf Hitler emergency powers um, to deal with this emergency. And basically they give him total authority to handle the situation. And so what's going to happen? Uh, he's going to gain, he's going to gain power for himself and he's never going to let it go. Um, you know, it's, it's a common misconception. A lot of people have about Hitler being elected by the German people. He was actually never elected to public office. Uh, he was appointed uh, as chancellor, he had lost um, the one race that he had run for president to Hindenburg. Um, but he was never actually elected. Now, there will be elections in the future uh, with Hitler on the ballot. He will win those with like 99% of the vote. But he's actually never officially elected. So, that brings us to the Night of the Long Knives. Uh, which is the first major uh, purge, if you will, of the uh, German government. My nose is itching. I don't know what's going on with me. Um, so after being granted emergency powers, Hitler took the opportunity to, I should say, purge uh, the NSDAP as well as take care of some political adversaries. So he actually starts to have people assassinated, including people who had started off with him way back before the, the, the Beer Hall Putsch days. Um, basically him and, and this guy named Rom, they don't get along as well as they used to get along. So bam, 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 uh, Hitler starts shooting people. Um, not, not by himself, but with, with the help of his stormtroopers. Um, about 500, uh, members of the NSDAP will be, uh, assassinated. Um, and while initially people outside of Germany are pretty shocked, people in Germany feel like Hitler's just taking action. Um, you know, uh, taking control of this situation, you know, these people just burned down the Reichstag, you know, somebody has got to pay for that. And, um, you know, they just, they feel like he's just doing his job. Um, so in 1934, Hindenburg dies shortly after the night of the long knives. Um, and Hitler actually has the office of the chancellor merged with the office of the president. So there's no need for another election. Hitler came in second last time, so he'll, so he'll just, you know, take that spot. He was already the chancellor, and basically nobody's going to be appointed chancellor. Either he's going to be the president slash chancellor. Um, later on that year, in 1934, he has the entire Reichswehr, uh, which is the German military, uh, swear an oath of allegiance to him and removed any officers who dissented. So if you didn't like the Hitler... Um, you know, they basically, they basically replace, uh, the word German or fatherland in the oath of the military has to take and replace it with Hitler, um, which is start where you see, see, you hear that the hell Hitler, 
um, you know, before that hadn't been that. Um, but he, he uh, forces all the German military to do that. Uh, by 1935, Germ- Hitler is officially uh, the dictator of Germany. He doesn't call himself the dictator. That's, you know, that's the word that we use. Um, but he is effectively the leader um, of, the, of Germany without any check on his power. By 1935, he's, he's got complete power. So, we'll start off talking about Hitler and the economy, because it's important to really understand why Hitler was able to maintain power. Um, with all the things that we know about Hitler now, and it, it's, it's easy for us to get caught up in it and say, you know, why didn't the Germans stop him, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, the truth of the matter is, things in Germany were not great. Okay, one. Two, the German people didn't really vote for him. So, I mean, they would have some people would have had to actually revolt against him. Um, and of course, not everybody knows exactly what he's going to do. Um, you know, the hindsight—you know, hindsight's twenty-twenty. People didn't really know what he was going to do. Um, whenever he first comes to power, he breaks up the workers' unions um, and gains the favor of wealthy business owners. Um, you know, he's—you know—he—he's not a like I said, he's not a socialist. This guy breaks up the uh, workers' unions. He breaks up political parties that are related to socialists. Um, and basically he puts all of Germany back to work. Um, he's, he primes what we call primes the economy, uh, which basically is just like government spending, um, which is kind of a socialist tendency, but he's not doing it to help workers. He's doing it just to help himself, basically. Um, he primes the economy through military spending projects, so he puts people back to work and builds up the military infrastructure in Germany, and this makes him really popular among Germans. I mean, anytime that you've got a booming economy um, and people going back to work and making a, a paycheck and being able to to afford, you know, food, which had been a problem in the recent decade, um, then, you know, people are going to start to think pretty highly of you. So regardless of whatever else he might have thought um, or done, um, the average German worker all of a sudden has a job, has a paycheck that's, you know, this starts to make you pretty popular. Um, so with his newfound popularity among Germans, he starts to try to strip away at the clauses in the Treaty of Versailles that kind of limit his power. Um, and the first thing that he does is he triples the size of the German military. Now, the terms of the Treaty of Versailles had said that the military could only be 100,000 strong. He bumps it up to 300,000. Um, saying that basically Germany has to be able to protect itself and 100,000 100, men, they just can't do it. Um, and, you know, it's been 17 years since the end of World War I. Um, you know, Great Britain, France, other nations have much larger armies, so they kind of just cave on that one. Um, and that's the first domino uh, that's going to start to fall. Um, He also supplements his army with a paramilitary force. Um, We talked about the brown shirts already, the stormtroopers. They're going to start recruiting people for this um, Gestapo or the SS um, who are going to be this paramilitary force, kind of like police force, um, who are going to kind of supplement the the army number. So officially the army is going to be 300,000, but by the time war breaks out, it's going to actually be a lot larger because we realize now that all these uh, you know, police uh, were actually just, you know, different uh, units in, an, in the army. So Hitler and the Jews. So it, we don't jump right to the Holocaust, and we're going to save the Holocaust for another conversation. Um, but there is violence that starts to break out immediately as soon as Hitler gains complete power in 1935. The first thing he does is he implements something called the Nuremberg Laws. Um, now, if anybody's familiar with how the story ends, you know, there's going to be the Nuremberg trials um, after the war uh, for war crimes. But the initial Nuremberg laws uh, that get implemented in 1935 basically stripped all Jews in Germany of any citizenship to Germany um, and basically restricts all the rights that they have um, immediately. They have to start wearing um the Star of David to signify that they are Jewish uh, when they're out on the streets. They had to put it on their their, their, their uh, business windows, um, and uh, they're not allowed to marry other Germans who aren't Jewish. Um, it's there's a lot of other laws that, that are put in, but basically they have no rights. They can't vote. 
Um, they can't drive cars. I mean, it's a really, the really thought of as second class citizens. It's not just Jews, it's also gypsies um, and, you know, people with uh, mental, um, you know, uh, uh, mental handicaps or physical handicaps, people of color. Um, you know, we think mainly it's the Jews because they haven't had the biggest population of the people who are being oppressed, but it's not just the Jews. Um, and that starts in 1935. Now, it'll be a couple more years before things get really bad. Um, but um, for this moment, um, it's not um, it's not quite that yet, but we're building into it. So um, in 1938, uh, 12,000 Polish Jews were forced to leave in the middle of the night. I can't remember exactly what day it was. Uh, but there's one day that they were all just forced to leave in the middle of the night. They were forced to pack one suitcase, just one. Uh, they were marched out um, and taken to the Polish border. Um, but the Polish government um, had actually renounced their citizenship already, so they weren't allowed to return to Poland. So for a series of a couple months, these 12,000 Jews are just forced to stay on the Jew on the uh, I'm sorry German and Polish border without having access to either country. Um, they did not have any shelter. They did not have enough money for food. They did not have any clothes. Um, and they were forced to live in the elements until eventually the Polish government caved in and allowed them to come to Poland. But, um, you know, not a great look for the Polish government, but they did have a lot of problems they were having to deal with. And they're going to get their share of it here in just a, about another year. Then... On November 10th, 1938, violence breaks out against Jews all over Germany in an event called the Crystal Nacht, uh, which you had an assignment that you had to do um, on the Crystal Nacht on, on Converge. K-R-I-S-T-A-L-L-N-A-C-H-T. I don't know why I didn't put it um, right down here, but it's, it was called Crystal Nacht. Um, and over 7,500 Jewish businesses were completely destroyed. Um, or at least had the glass busted out um, of the front windows. A lot of synagogues got burnt, um, and a lot of businesses were looted. Um, and 30,000 Jews were actually taken to concentration camps that night there in 1938. Uh, millions of goods, uh, millions of dollars of goods stolen. Um, and then the Jewish people would be fined a billion dollars after Afterwards, the sum of all the, the fines, about a, a, a billion dollars, for damage done to their stores that they had no control over, that they had to pay. A billion dollars. If they were able to pay. Most of them were not able to pay because they had been completely robbed blind. Um, but, to, I mean, this is not a great situation. A lot of these Jews are going to try to flee the country. Um, but, as part of not having any citizenship anymore, they did not have visas um, or papers that allowed them to travel to other countries. So other countries start to restrict uh, the rights of these Jews traveling to their country. So really a terrible situation for Jews all around. Hitler wants the Jews to leave, but he basically limits the, the ability for them to leave um, because maybe he didn't actually want them to leave. Maybe he did just want to exterminate them even back uh, in 1938 or even all the way back in 1935. So let's we'll we'll leave Germany for a little while. We've kind of got them up to speed. So let's talk about another guy um, who we're not going to spend nearly enough time on um, because we just don't have enough time. Um, but um, an extremely fascinating character uh, named Joseph Stalin. Um, Joseph Stalin's actual name uh, was Koba. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever seen. Uh, Planet of the Apes, but the bad guy, you know, the bad ape in Planet of the Apes is named Koba. Comes from, I think, comes from Joseph Stalin. Um, so Stalin, tell you a story about Stalin that I that I read in Catherine Meredell's book um, on um, the uh, Eastern, the war in the Eastern Front during World War Two. Um, so when when um, Joseph Stalin was younger. He was, he was, him and a group of friends were out, um, and they were walking along a stream. And there had been recently been a flood, 
and um, they're walking and they hear the, the pleats of this uh, calf that was stranded on an island in this, you know, this, this swollen river and he's, and this calf's not able to get off and, you know, it's calling for its mom. Um, Joseph Stalin, you know, kind of, they're, they're kind of talking amongst each other about who's going to go and help the calf. Joseph Stalin, uh, volunteers himself to go over, uh, swims out to the, um, to the calf in the, in the island in the stream. Um, and once all of his friends are watching him, he breaks the calf's legs and leaves it there to die. Um, and that is a story that, to my knowledge, is true about Joseph Stalin, or at least the person who, who told the story to Captain Meridale, who was a person who had grown up with Joseph Stalin, says that it's absolutely true. So um, that's the kind of person that we're dealing with. So we just went from Mussolini to Hitler to another just absolutely horrible person in um, Joseph Stalin. So... Vladimir Lenin had been the uh, uh, leader of the Bolsheviks um, and eventually the the ruler of the Soviet Union following the um, Russian Civil War, which ends in 1921. But Lenin has been kind of sickly. He's been sickly throughout his life, and in 1923, he finally succumbs and dies. Now, when he died, he had had it in his will that there was one person that he did not want to take over the Soviet Union, um, because he felt like he was too ruthless. And that's saying a lot coming from Vladimir Lenin, who happened to be pretty ruthless himself. Um, but that guy was Joseph Stalin. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the Soviet Union did not do enough to kind of prevent him from taking power. Um, now it's not clear who's going to be the person to take over control in the Soviet Union for a while. Um, there's some back and forth, a lot of political games, but the problem that the other people who want to buy for the position like Bukharin um, and um, Trotsky um, is that uh, um, Joseph Stalin was the party general secretary. Um, he had been in charge of all the paperwork. He knew all the secrets about everyone, and he was a master in the political game. He was a master in turning people against other people. Um, and then after he's got you on his side, then throwing you to the wolves. That was his specialty. Um, and he's going to do that um, pretty frequently on his rise to rise to power. And immediately, you know, he starts um, with purges, assassinations. He uses, um, they weren't called the KGB at, the, at that time, but basically you think of the KGB, the Russian secret police. He gets them on his side and starts to gain authority. And by 1927, he is in firm control of the Soviet Union as the Soviet premier. Um, once he gets power in 1927, he's going to try to rapidly industrialize the Soviet Union. Now, this is a problem going back that, this, that Vladimir Lenin was aware of as well. Um, but basically, everybody knows that the Soviet Union is far behind the other countries in terms of the... the um, industrial revolution they just don't have the industrial output that other countries have so he puts together these things called five-year plans um, that are effectively going to rapidly bring uh, the soviet union up to speed with everyone else um, he starts this forced collectivization of all farms um, basically you know it's hard to really we don't really have enough time to talk about this but um, basically Lenin had promised all these peasants, all this land. Um, when he came onto the scene, he promised them peace, land, and bread, um, which was very appealing to the peasants. When, by the time Stalin, Stalin's in, in office, they had been doing this thing called war communism, where basically they had taken over the farms. Now they had let these people, these peasants, like, um, they were called kulaks. They were the people who were in charge of these collective farms. They had let them kind of run it. But when Stalin gets in charge, he doesn't like them. They're not fitting what he needs, which is which he needs a product to sell abroad so that they can make some money so they can then spend on factories and, and things like that. They're putting too much of it back, you know, for him. They're keeping too much of the profit. 
So he forces this collectivization all across. Um, I put the collectivization of farms all across Europe. I had too many type. I don't know why I had all these typos, but really it's just the Soviet Union. He forces all this collectivization farms all across um, uh, the Soviet Union so that he can feed his workers who are working in the factories that he's building and then um, sell that grain on the on the European market so that they have some money to then reinvest into the country. Uh, so there's two five-year plans. The first one is the most famous one, um, and it's famous for a reason that Stalin would not have liked it to be famous for. But uh, there is this event known as the Holodomor, uh, which we haven't, we're not even getting into the Holocaust yet, but we're talking about something that may have been even worse uh, than the Holocaust, and we're not going to have enough time to really talk about it. But basically, this forced collectivization um, you know, we talked about the agricultural revolution back, you know, way back a couple months ago. Um, there was, you know, we talked about crop rotation, about how important crop rotation was to keeping the the, the soil fertile. Uh, but in the Ukraine, in these in these collective farms, they were growing the same thing every year. They were just growing grain, one type of grain as much as they can produce so they can sell it on the market. Well, in 1932, there's this massive famine that breaks out. Um, there, nobody's able to grow any grain. It happens in the Ukraine. Um, and it is a it is an absolutely terrible... We don't know enough about this time. Um, and we, we know a lot because we've been able to get access to the records, but for a long time, those records were kind of kept under wraps, and people really didn't even know how bad the famine was. Um, but basically, Joseph Stalin forcefully starved Ukrainian peasants for two years during this time. Um, it's it's estimated that approximately 10 million people died as a direct result of the famine. And we talk about the Holocaust and the 6 million Jews, and we should. You know, that's an important thing for us to talk about um, because it was awful. But so was the Holodomor. Um, Stalin basically turns a blind eye. He, there's actually, Russia produces enough grain that they could have fed those people in the Ukraine. But that would have taken away the profits that Stalin needed to pay for his factories. So he, even with the, even with the, um, this terrible famine going on and people starving to death literally in the streets, um, of the Ukraine, Stalin still takes that grain and puts it on the European market so that he can get money to build his factories. And like I said, as many, it's, a, it's the 10 million is an upper level number. Usually you see five and a half to six and a half million. Um, either way, bad. A lot of people die. Uh, and this is the time where Stalin famously or infamously or maybe never, I don't know, but he's usually attributed with this quote, uh, the quote being that uh, one death is a tragedy and a million deaths is a, is a statistic. Um, and as awful as that statement is, there's a lot of truth to it. You know, we live right now in the COVID-19 days. You know, we see the numbers every day. Um, but unless it is knocking on your door and, and it's someone who you actually know personally, you know, after, after a while, the numbers seem to have a numbing effect. Um, and that's kind of the way Joseph Stalin felt about about this. Um, and, and like I said, he did not care that 10 million people were dying, especially since they were Ukrainians. Ukraine was technically a part of the Soviet Union at this time, but Stalin didn't care. He literally did not care. So, with all that happiness out of the way, then we get to the Spanish Civil War, where we're going to see it a lot. Uh, or we're going to see some more mass, um, <laughs> um, we're going to see some more uh, mass misery uh, and death. Uh, so in 1936, uh, after years of political unrest, um, there's a civil war breaks out in Spain. Um, and this war immediately becomes a proxy war between Germany and the Soviet Union, because on one side you have these Republicans who were basically left-wing, super left-wing, Marxist, communist type. They were they were supported by the Soviet Union uh, and Joseph Stalin. Um, and on the other side, you have this, this uh, fascist party 
um, this nationalist party led by a guy named Francisco Franco, uh, who Germany and Italy threw their way behind. Um, Hitler sees this as an, as an opportunity to start to kind of test some of the military equipment that Germany has been uh, secretly producing. They've been creating these, uh, they've been building these new airplanes, um, and this is an opportunity for him to try them out on the world stage. Um, and he does. The Luftwaffe um, gets its debut um, in Spain. Um, and we're cutting right to the chase on this, but for three years they fight it out. Um, but Soviet Union really doesn't have the ability to really funnel supplies into Spain the same way that Germany can funnel supplies in, into Spain. Um, Great Britain and France turn a blind eye to what's going on. The French kind of support uh, the Republicans, but they're kind of too communist for them. Um, and so they don't really get that enthusiastic about it. And eventually Francisco Franco wins uh, in 1939. But um, Spain is going to be so devastated by the Civil War that they're not going to be in any position to fight a war against anyone else um, by the time World War II breaks out. So even though they would naturally be an ally um, of Germany, considering the support that Franco got from Hitler, um, they just don't have the ability to help out. Um, And so they remain neutral during World War II. Um, This painting here that I put in here is, is called Guernica. Um, and it is by Pablo Picasso, which some of you may be familiar with. He actually moves to the United States later, has a famous painting show. It was on TV for a long time. Um, but he was, was known for this style of art, and you'd have to ask Mr. Withers about exactly what style it is. But, but Guernica was actually a painting of um, one of those bombings um, of German airplane over the city of Guernica. And that's what this painting is supposed to represent. So, um, with the Spanish Civil War, well, this, uh, this event actually happens before the Spanish Civil War. This is a fight uh, between um, Italy and Ethiopia in 1935. Now, you may remember, you may not remember, uh, but when we talked about imperialism of Africa, there was one nation that was actually successfully able to remain independent um, while, you know, all the carving up of Africa was going on, and it was Ethiopia, um, or as it's called, um, Abyssinia or Eritrea. It has a lot of different names, but basically Ethiopia. Um, so in 1935, Mussolini is trying to expand um, the um, Italian government, or, or the, the Italian um Empire, the Italian Empire, to try to match the the glory days of the Roman Empire. Uh, So in 1935, he sets out to actually finally take over Ethiopia. Now at this point, he's got mechanized uh, weapons. He's got tanks. uh, He's got jeeps. Now, not as many as you would think. Um, You know, there's still a lot of horses used by the Italians, just like there's going to be a lot of horses used by the Germans. Um, during World War II, and it's going to end up being one of the fatal flaws um, of the the Axis powers is that they don't actually have the the manufacturing power of the other nations, and they're still reliant on horsepower. Um, so anyway, he invades in 1935. By, by the early 1936, they have conquered Ethiopia. And that's just kind of... And then again, you know, the League of Nations exists, um, and they don't intervene... Uh, another opportunity that they they had to maybe try to stop some of the aggressive moves that these nations were making, and, and again, they don't take any action. So, I know this is taking a long time. Um, so we jump to Hitler and appeasement. Um, you know, that's the big A word that you hear thrown around most of the time when we're talking about um, Hitler, um, especially the last days before World War II. Um, so w- with uh, power in Germany consolidated, Hitler begins to pu- push the envelope uh, in expanding German borders. Uh, he starts by winning a plebiscite. Remember, we started off talking about what a plebiscite was. Um, he wins the plebiscite in the Saar Valley in 1935. He didn't have to do anything. I said that was a freebie. The Saar Valley had init- initially been a part of the German Empire. Um, you know, the French had taken it away after World War One, but nobody there was French. Um, although there was a lot of coal mines there, the people there 
were German. And so when they had the chance to vote in 1935, they voted to rejoin Germany. Seems only natural. Um, But having already broken the Treaty of Versailles in regards to the size of the military, Hitler goes a step further in 1936 and remilitarizes the Rhineland, uh, which had been forbidden under the Versailles Treaty. Um, The reason being that the Rhine is pretty close to the French border, um, and as part of the, the Treaty of Versailles, they weren't allowed to keep any military installations there. But in 1936... You know, it's been 18 years since the end of, of, of World War I. They remilitarized the, the Rhineland. Uh, France kind of freaks out for a second. Uh, they, go to, they go to Great Britain. Great Britain doesn't care a lick about it. They do not care. They could not be begged to care. Um, you know, they, they, they're looking around for the, the, their cares. They don't have any. Um, so France just kind of backs down. You know, that's another, that's another domino has fallen. Um, and you know, they, they just assumed that it was all right at that point. If it was German territory, if they wanted to defend it, it's up to them, you know, whatever. So that's the first one. Uh, the next one is something called the Anschluss. Uh, this is 1938. So two years have passed since the remilitarization of the Rhineland. So this is going to be a way oversimplification of what happens in the Anschluss. And maybe I should have broken this up into two lectures because I know this is taking a long time. Um, but basically, there is it, the, the Anschluss refers to a political union between Germany and Austria. Uh, in 1938, uh, Austrian Nazis try to take over the Austrian government uh, democratically, and they fail. So being Nazis, the Nazis, the sneaky little Nazis that they are, um, they're not just going to take that line down. They're not just going to take the will of the people. Like, pfft, what do people know? Um, so they actually they actually try to appeal to Hitler, basically saying that they are mistreated um, and that Hitler needs to intervene. So Hitler basically delivers an ultimatum to Austria, um, saying that, that the Austrians need to either allow the Nazis to um, join um, the polit- or, you know, join the, the political arena in Austria or, or get more power in Austria, um, or they need to join with Germany and create, you know, one, um, you know, one country, uh, basically that they have a lot in common, um, and that they should just form one country and that Austria should just agree to that. Um, the chancellor, um, or the person who's in charge of Austria does not play along with that at all <laughs> um, and immediately calls for a, a referendum um, for the Austrian people to vote for themselves, a plebiscite, if you will, um, to answer the question about what Austrians want to do. Now, the Austrian Nazis know that they will lose if that happens, that the majority of Austrians don't really favor that. They favor their own independence. Uh, they just got out of being in a long-term um, you know, affair with an empire. They don't want to do that anymore. They want to be their own nation. Hitler doesn't really like that, though. Um, and so the night before the election was supposed to take place, um, the German military actually crosses the border and starts to overthrow voting um, installations throughout um, Austria. And within five days, um, the chancellor or the person who was in charge of Austria at the time basically has to resign. Um, and Hitler takes over without even a shot being fired. So in five days, um, Hitler goes from probably, you know, not having any or not having any say in what goes on in Austria to basically creating an Austrian German state. Um, and again, the League of Nations exists. It has Ger- it has Great Britain and France and several other nations. And again, they don't do anything to help the Austrian people out. And the Austrian Nazis um, are triumphant. Immediately, Austrian Jews begin to be persecuted. I mean, just as soon as the Germans uh, step onto Austrian territory. Um, and that um, is basically the end of it without even a shot being fired. <clears throat> So that's another domino. It's like our third or fourth domino that we've mentioned. All these opportunities, they could have been stopped. Anyway, so then you have this land called the Sudetenland. Now on your 
slide, this area on the outside that's kind of shaded in, that is what is called the Sudetenland. This is a part of Czechoslovakia, uh, which is a country that borders Germany. Basically, Germany is all around here, kind of like a crescent moon. Oh, man. Let me go back. Yeah, kind of like a crescent moon around the outside. Um, so, in the Sudetenland, there's a lot of ethnic Germans who are now a part of um, Czechoslovakia. Hitler claims that these people are being persecuted by the Czechoslovakian government. Now, the Czechoslovakian government is mostly run by Slavs, um, you know, Slovaks, um, people who are ethnically more in tune with uh, Russians. Um, and so they don't really get along. Um, so maybe they were. I don't know. Nobody, I mean, I, I've, I've not read a study that said whether they were really being persecuted or not. Um, but ultimately, it was technically supposed to be a part of Czechoslovakia. Um, but Hitler basically argues that the Sudetenland needs to join Germany. Uh, and he appeals to the French and the British about the Sudetenland. He kind of rattles the saber, acting like they're going to maybe have to invade Czechoslovakia. Um, tries to entice the Czechoslovakia, tries to pay for Czechoslovakia to give them all this territory. Now, the Czechs do not want to give them this territory because they have put a lot of expensive uh, fortifications in those areas to prevent a German assault into their country. Okay, they have a lot of weapons. They have pillboxes. They have, you know, bunkers, trenches that are built to try to prevent, you know, any of this, uh, or, or, you know, Germany invading them. You know, it's only been a, a six, 18 years since the end of World War I. Um, the Czechs, you know, if the League of Nations had been, you know, a, a, uh, entity that had any power, they would have put a stop to it. But unfortunately, they don't. Um, and the French and the British decide that they will work with Germany um, to um, basically create an agreement where they will get the Sudetenland in exchange for a note that says that they have no other ambitions and they will stop trying to take over territory. So basically... It's like trying to get a bear to stop eating you by feeding it food. Um, you know, maybe that'll work for a while, uh, but eventually the bear's going to get hungry again, and he's going to come back after you. Um, so um, the British and French actually work together with the Germans with no checks at the table. They do not even consult Czechoslovakia to see what Czechoslovakia wants. Um, because basically, between France, Germany, and Great Britain, they have plenty of power to just force Czechoslovakia to accept whatever terms they decide are necessary for them. But basically, they leave Czechoslovakia completely undefensible. Um, and, you know, once um, the war gets broken out, Czechoslovakia will fall very quickly. Um, and um, the agreement that they come to is called the Munich Agreement. If you, if you remember back to the... the um, let me go back. This right here. This is Neville Chamberlain. No, too far. This is Neville Chamberlain after the Munich Agreement holding up a piece of paper um, that he call, he said was peace in our time. Um, there's actually a movie, and I can't remember. The, the I think it's called The Longest Hour or Darkest Hour, maybe, that, that uh, is about Winston Churchill. It just came out recently. I think it might be on Netflix even. Um, but it's about the, the uh, relationship between Winston Churchill and Neville Chamberlain to some degree and Neville Chamberlain talking about, um, you know, the, the, uh, Munich agreement and how Hitler was supposed to not take any further action and that everybody's trying to avoid this war. But ultimately, uh, the Munich agreement is just a piece of paper. Um, and it's only going to be a year before Hitler's breaking it again. So, we'll skip ahead. To the Non-Aggression Pact. So, in 1939, 
for many years, people thought that the Soviet Union and Germany were mortal enemies. I mean, if you read Mein Kampf, then you know that Hitler does not like communists. He does not like Jews. Uh, but he really doesn't like the Soviet Union, and he thinks they are a joke, basically. Um, but despite all of that, the Soviets and Germans had been working secretly for several years to work on expanding their militaries, to work on uh, tank technology, military maneuvers, yada, 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 uh, basically playing war games with each other uh, in the Soviet Union, um, you know, without the British and French being able to watch them um, or without anybody being able to know what was going on. So in 1939, they signed this non-aggression pact. Now, it's usually called the Molotov-Ribbentrop uh, Pact because those were the two foreign secretaries who signed it. But basically, it is a, a, a agreement that they are not going to attack each other. But the key part of the agreement that was not public uh, was that they agreed to divide Poland up between the two of them. Um, and, you know, Poland had been this new nation, um, but... The Poles were not liked by the Soviets, and they were not liked by the Germans. Um, And again, Hitler was hungry for territory, as was the Soviet Union. So, on September 1st, 1939, Germany and the Soviet Union initiated a two-sided invasion of Poland. This is called sometimes called the Second Polish Partition, um, and they are going to treat Poland brutally. I don't really have enough time to talk about all the horrors that is going to happen to the Polish people, but basically it doesn't matter which side they face. People who want to kill them are coming after them. Um, and it's a, it's really just amazing that there's even a Poland on the map today um, because of just how badly this is going to go for them. Now, Great Britain and France had warned or, or Germany after uh, the Munich Agreement that they would not take any more. They drew the line at Poland. Um, basically they told Hitler that as, as an ultimatum that if he invaded Poland, they would declare war on him. And so when he invades in September, on September the 1st, they finally do, uh, declare war on him. Um, the Soviet Union invades, they, the Soviet Union also invades Estonia, Finland, and Lithuania. Things are going to go very poorly for the Soviet Union in Finland. Um, there's actually, they're going to lose several hundred thousand soldiers trying to take over Finland. Um, and the Finns, similar to the Poles, they're going to have it very brutal. They're actually going to side with the Germans when Germany invades the Soviet Union, as you might expect them to. I mean, an enemy of my enemy becomes my friend. Um, and they're not going to feel like they have any any option. Um, eventually, they're going to technically kind of keep the Soviet Union out of Finland uh, to some degree. Uh, but anyway, this, this period of time sets up something called the Phony Wars. It's going to be until May of 1940 before fighting between France and Germany really happens, even though they declare war on September 1st, even though there was plenty of opportunity for France and Great Britain to invade Germany and move towards Berlin and really kind of force Germany's hand early in the war. Instead, they sat and rested on their laurels, um, and it came back to bite them in the butt in a big way, which we'll talk about later. So we're going to kind of This has gone on way too long, so we're going to kind of sum it up here. So there are three main causes of World War II in Europe. The first is a rise of nationalism as a result of harsh terms of the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, There's a rise of nationalism in Germany. There's a rise of nationalism in Italy. Um, There's even a rise of nationalism in the Soviet Union, even though there's not really nationalistic there. Um, But... um, you know, because of the harsh terms of the Treaty of Versailles, these people are going to look to try to take matters into their own hands. Uh, two, political extremism as a result of economic hardships. Um, but I put hardship O's. I should say hardships um, from the Treaty of Versailles. So anytime that you have a situation where a Great Depression breaks out, people are more susceptible to political extremism. Or demagogues, people who you know just say what they want, what you they think you uh, they want you to to hear, um, and political appeasement from the League of Nations in an effort to prevent war. Now, you know we've, I've given Neville Chamberlain and Great Britain and the League of Nations a bad rap for appeasement 
To be fair to them, the worst war that the world had ever seen had just happened, and many of them had even fought in that war, and they wanted to do everything they could to prevent something like that from happening again. Um, but looking back now, we know you know what these people's future is, and we know that, the, that a war even worse than the one they just fought is coming as a result of their actions or, you know, in a lot of cases, inaction. So there you go. I feel like I've talked way long enough. So I'm going to let you all go. Uh, again, if you can do it, uh, make sure you send me an email, bradley at wayne.kyschools.us. Um, but hope you all are staying safe, uh, staying home, staying safe, uh, staying healthy, healthy at home, together KY, all that good stuff. Um, and I'll, look, I'll be posting another one of these. It will not be as long as this one. This one covered a lot of ground. Um, but um, you should have another one about um, about uh, the, the, the interwar years uh, in Asia with Japan and China. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that goes on there, but it won't take nearly as long because you really just got uh, China and Japan to deal with. So um, we'll talk about that next time. Um, hope you all stay safe. Make sure you're doing your NTI work. If you have any questions, let me know. Thanks.